Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on your time zone. Welcome to the Dudrick Symposium session. I am Charlene Kumpfer, uh, a friend and colleague of Dr. Stanley Dudrick, and I will begin with a short tribute to Dr. Dudrick. While he's rightly known as the father of parenteral nutrition, another apt title might be mentor-in-chief. Clearly, the Dudrick scholars, such as Nilesh and Dr. Pimiento, who you will hear from today, had a special relationship with Dr. Dudrick, as did his many trainees over his long academic surgical career. However, his ability to touch and inspire excellence in nutrition support practice extends far beyond those fortunate enough to train with him or have direct contact as a protege. I had the honor of attending conferences in many of our sister societies all over the globe representing Aspen during my presidential year. Many, many conference leaders shared images of Dr. Dudrick attending their conference and spoke of the great influence that he exerted on practicing clinicians. He also made rounds in their hospitals to help them consider best treatment options. When the Aspen board made a call for tributes and images as part of our celebration of his many contributions with his Lifetime Achievement Award in 2017, Contributions flowed in from all corners of the globe and all parts of this country. As a clinical dietitian who began practice just after the availability of parenteral nutrition, my own career path and those of many of my colleagues have been mentored both indirectly and directly through Dr. Dudrick's sizable footprint. As a clinician who works primarily with home parenteral nutrition patients, I also hear regularly how very important his research and clinical contributions have been to the quality and even quantity of their lives, mentoring them as whole individuals able to contribute to society. I was awed and honored to be Aspen's president 40 years after Dr. Dudrick's first presidential year. Let's hold the many stories that he told including those in his interview by Dr. Ezra Steiger at Aspen as parts of his legacy. Now let's view the tribute video that was created in 2017 for his Lifetime Achievement Award. On behalf of the Aspen Board of Directors and the patients we serve, let me express our heartfelt thanks for the impact of your paradigm-shifting research on patient care and quality of life. As a clinical nutrition scientist, you have always been an amazing inspiration to me throughout my career. Stan, I congratulate you on this magnificent achievement for all your work and your many publications over the years that has been an inspiration to us all. From those days in the 60s, yes, the 60s, who could have imagined your career trajectory and milestone innovations. From the first time I met you, when you were congratulating me as a young researcher receiving an Aspen Rhodes Research Foundation grant, I have always appreciated your leadership, vision, and perspective. I vividly remember the first patients at Cha and Hop, Kayleen and Melvin, and many of the patients since then who have been very grateful for your contributions. As I've reached out to local and global leaders in preparation for this event, I've heard so many wonderful stories of the generous mentorship that's a trademark of your professional contributions to others. So congratulations to you on this momentous occasion. You certainly deserve this recognition. And I'd like to thank you again for your amazing leadership and for being such an inspiration to all of us at Aspen. So congratulations again, and my very best wishes for the future. We view you proudly and add to this current accolade. Carry on. Dr. Dudrick, yours is a role model we must emulate for future generations. Thank you so much.
Thanks to Dr. Dedrick and his contributions to the field of nutrition support, I've been able to live the past six years of my life with the assistance of TPN. There are not words to express how much I'm grateful to Dr. Dudrick for all of his contributions. He's allowed me not only to survive, but to thrive with the use of TPN. Thanks so much, Dr. Dudrick. Last year, I had the opportunity, along with many other TPN consumers, to meet Dr. Dudrick at a conference. I've been on TPN since birth for 32 years, and along with everyone else there, we represented a combined 528 years of life fueled by TPN. And that's only a very small fraction of the number of lives that he's helped. And my life is not only better because of him, but my life is possible because of him. And I just want to say thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, Dr. Dedrick. That was indeed a heartwarming video tribute to Dr. Dudrick. Thank you, Dr. Comfort, for your kind words. My name is Nilesh Mehta. Since 1985, the Stanley J. Dudrick Research Scholar Award recognizes mid-career investigators who have demonstrated exceptional research productivity and sustained contributions to the field of nutrition therapy. Dr. Dudrick took immense pleasure in reviewing portfolios of highly accomplished investigators and selecting the awardee. The award winner has the honor of planning and chairing the Dudrick Symposium the following year. We welcome you today to this year's Dudrick Symposium. This was one of Dr. Dudrick's favorite sessions at the conference. His commitment to fostering the next generation of innovators, his undiminished scientific curiosity and engagement during the program, and his warm generosity in recognizing the awardee were all in full display as he sat in the front row. Today, we miss him dearly, but we will honor his legacy by continuing this prestigious Aspen tradition. So without further ado, I would like to now introduce last year's Dudrick Award winner. Dr. Jose Pimiento is the medical director of the inpatient surgical service and the leader of upper gastrointestinal oncology section at the H. Lee Moffitt Cancer Center. Dr. Pimiento was born in Colombia, where he attended medical school at the National University of Colombia. He completed his surgical training in St. Mary's Health System in Waterbury, Connecticut, a Yale University affiliated program where he also engaged in vascular biology research. Additionally, he trained in surgical oncology at the H. Lee Moffitt Cancer Center. His area of clinical and translational research is in foregut cancers, including gastric, esophageal, and pancreatic malignancies, with special interest in chemo prevention strategies, nutritional support of patients, and minimally invasive techniques in the field of gastrointestinal malignancies. Dr. Pimiento was awarded the Stanley J. Dudrick Research Scholar Award last year. Please join Dr. Comfer and me in welcoming Dr. Pimiento and his faculty team to present the Aspen 2020 Dudrick Symposium. Congratulations and welcome, Dr. Pimient. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Mera. Um, I really appreciate that uh, uh, kind introduction. Uh, and I want to welcome you all, uh, and I want to welcome all you guys to the Dudrick Symposium, Expanding the Boundaries of Cancer Care to Nutritional Support. These are our learning objectives. And um, also, as a little housekeeping uh, thing, uh, please find the question uh, panel in the left side of your uh, player. So if you have questions, please write them there, and we'll try to go through some of them at the end of the uh, session. Uh, we have an amazing, incredible roster of speakers. Uh, I'm just so privileged to have um, my name amongst them. Uh, certainly, I don't I, I don't compare to their achievements, but I, I feel very honored to, to be in their presence. Uh, we'll start with uh, Dr. Uh, Daly, who is a surgical oncologist at Fox Chase Cancer Center and uh, the dean of the Louis Katz School of Medicine at Temple University. Uh, he has been one of the, the strongest proponents of uh, surgical oncology uh, nutrition 
uh, the nutrition of the cancer patient, and uh, he is a past president of Aspen. Uh, he is one of the earliest contributors uh, and collaborators of Dr. Dodrick, and probably one of his dearest friends. Uh, he's going to talk to us a little bit about the impact that uh, Dr. Dodrick had in the um, care of uh, cancer patients and the nutrition of cancer patients. Uh, I'll be following him with a talk about uh, nutraceuticals and his uh, role on uh, chemo prevention. Uh, then uh, Dr. Bill Kramer, a professor of human sciences at Ohio State University, and probably one of the uh, forefathers of uh, exercise physiology. Um, he has an incredibly extensive uh, portfolio of um, research in uh, this area. And we're going to be delighted by hearing talking about uh, the um, role of bringing nutrition uh, and uh, exercise uh, therapy together for the benefit of cancer patients. This is a subject that I don't think we are covering enough and it's going to be very important uh, for the um, bringing this surgical oncology cancer, uh, nutritional cancer care for our patients. Finally, uh, we'll be hearing from Dr. Hursting, that is a professor of the Department of uh, Nutrition and the Lindenberg Cancer Center at the University of uh, North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Um, he is um, a former uh, deputy director of the NCI Office of Preventive Oncology and the chief of the NCI uh, Nutrition and Molecular Carcinogenesis Laboratory Section. He's an international uh, known uh, researcher in the area of obesity and cancer and the impact that obesity can have in the development of cancer and the treatment of cancer. And we're going to be very um, lucky to hear him talk about uh, this uh, subject today. Uh, so without further ado, I let you um, get into the session and please, um, let's welcome Dr. Daly. Thank you, Dr. Pimiento, very much. Good. Thank you, Dr. Pimiento, very much for your introduction. I'd like to take people back, if I could, uh, 53 years to 1967. That was when I first had the privilege to meet Dr. Dudrick. I was a college student at the time. And that time was a time when parental nutrition was very first shown in dogs and puppies that they could be grown without any enteral nutrition and grown to the same size and same weight as their counterpart in their litters. And that was a remarkable achievement. I want you to think back to a time when individuals who had GI fistulas, who had obstruction of their GI tract anywhere in their GI tract could not eat. And in the hospital, they starved. Malnutrition was rampant because of complications of abdominal or gastrointestinal surgery or other problems which in which patients could not eat. And so uh, a young surgical resident asked by Dr. Rhodes to try to solve the problem, recognized that the use of central venous catheterization would allow the administration of hypertonic solutions of glucose and amino acids, along with vitamins and minerals, to give people the opportunity to survive, and not just survive, but able to become re-nourished uh, intravenously. So it was a remarkable achievement. And over the next 10 years or so, individuals with all sorts of medical problems were treated. Ultimately, at the MD Anderson, which was part of the University of Texas system, Ted Copeland, along with Dr. Dudrick, began to treat patients with malignancy. And as they did, they showed that the use of TPN in cancer patients was safe. They, in fact, could provide rehabilitation, allowing for oncologic treatment with chemotherapy or radiation or allow people to undergo surgery, major surgery, safely. 
they noted that there was no apparent clinical stimulation of tumor growth and infection rates appeared similar to that of non-cancer patients. But they recognized that it required a team. That team was that of a physician, a nurse, pharmacist, and others who provided safety to the central line and safety to the solution management. At that time, there was still controversy as to the amount of calories per day, how those calories were administered, what were the percentages of fat and glucose that should be used, and the amino acid solutions. They recognized that clinical trials were critical to demonstrate the value of total parenteral nutrition in these individuals. They asked the question, as did the NIH and National Cancer Institute with multiple clinical trials, over a dozen clinical trials in patients with a variety of cancers, does TPN improve the response to chemotherapy often using well-nourished patients? And the answer was no, it did not. But will nutritional support allow treatment in some individuals who are malnourished and unable to receive chemotherapy? The answer was yes. And the final question was, is TPN, for example, safe in immunosuppressed cancer patients? And the answer to that was yes as well. So what are the guidelines for the use of nutrition in cancer patients? Well, first, we know that malnutrition and loss of muscle mass are really quite frequent in cancer patients and have a negative effect on clinical outcome. That has been shown over and over again over the last 50 years or more. We, should, we recognize that all cancer patients should be screened and guidelines recommend that at least 80% of patients with cancer should be screened for the risk or the presence of malnutrition. But unlike simple malnutrition, when, when the etiology is that of, of not simply just not eating enough, the negative energy balance and skeletal muscle loss that we see in cancer patients is usually driven by a combination of reduced food intake, but there's also metabolic derangements. There's often an elevated resting metabolic rate. There's insulin resistance, lipolysis, and proteolysis, which aggravate the weight loss and provide what we think of as a systemic inflammatory response and an increased muscle catabolism. Now, this is more common in certain cancers. So, for example, weight loss is quite common in individuals with pancreatic cancer or those who have lung cancer, but not necessarily at all common in a woman, for example, with breast cancer. So it varies by the type of malignancy. We know that muscle protein depletion occurs in cancer patients. We also recognize that the degree of muscle loss Muscle mass loss predicts the risk of physical impairment, also predicts postoperative complications, and in those receiving chemotherapy, enhanced toxicity, and it relates to mortality. A severe depletion of muscle mass is one would define as an absolute muscularity below the fifth percentile. This is, as I described, associated with a systemic, systemic inflammatory syndrome with altered carbohydrate and fat metabolism and also significant protein catabolism. And the consequences of this are weight loss, muscle mass loss, and extensive fatigue, all of which combines to a poor outcome. Whether that outcome is secondary to chemotherapy administration or the outcome is related to an operative event. Now, what's the treatment of cancer-associated malnutrition? Well, first and foremost is nutritional counseling. That's the most used and it's the most relevant. The next step would be in those that can do it, oral supplements. 
If that is not available, enteral and parenteral nutrition support at the recommended dosages as shown here, related to protein and related to energy. If no food for a week or less than 60% for one to two weeks. The first choice should always be enteral nutritional support, always. But if that's not available, PPN should be used. Physical therapy should also be done concomitantly with the provision of nutritional support. Along with that, there are some pharmacologic treatments that can be used. There are also uh, antiemetics. There are intestinal motility agents. Corticosteroids have been used, and although that inhibits uh, protein anabolism, the corticosteroids do provide for some weight gain, albeit most of that is water gain, but it provides for an increased sense of well-being. Some have used progestins or androgens, and these as well provide for some muscle accretion and a sense of well-being. Amarolin and inobasom have been used by many. Cannabinoids, of course, are used in cancer patients, providing a sense of, uh, of well-being in many of them. Some use the THC or others simply hemp products to try to provide uh, an improved psychologic and physical sense of well-being. And in other studies, beta-hydroxymethylbutyrate along with arginine, glutamine, for example, have also been used to try to improve muscle mass accretion. Now, many have argued that we should uh, provide increased dosages of both vitamins and minerals. But as shown by the American Cancer Society, in view of the restricted dietary pattern of tumor patients, vitamin and multi-mineral supplements should be in a physiologic dose. That's safe and useful, but not the use of single high-dose micronutrients. Many studies have shown that the use of elevated amounts of beta-carotene, vitamins A, C, E, selenium, either have no benefit, for example, or they actually provide for harm. They do not prevent cancer, and they may harm those with colon, prostate, or lung cancer. So elevated uses of single high-dose micronutrients should be avoided. Now, what about nutritional interventions? Well, there have been many studies, some very small in number, some larger. And meta-analysis have been used as in an attempt to try to combine these studies. In one such meta-analysis by Baldwin and others, they're published in the Journal of the National Cancer Institute back in 2012, 13 trials accrued over 1,000 patients. They noted that quality of life was significantly improved, but there was no difference in survival or response to chemotherapy. So routine use of nutritional support, that is, the use that was not triggered by a severe malnutrition or a relevant caloric deficit, there was no beneficial effect. Parental nutrition was often associated in these well-nourished patients with increased complications, increased infections, and in some instances, a decrease in tumor response. So there appears to be no value in providing prophylactic enteral and parenteral nutritional support in the well-nourished cancer patients. And that goes back to 50 years ago at the MD Anderson when Ted Copeland noted that nutritional intervention should be for malnourished cancer patients, not well-nourished patients. And that should, of course, be our current recommendations. Now, what about the use of enteral and parenteral nutrition in GI patients undergoing major surgery? Bazzetti and others in 
Lancet back in 2001 published a study with over 300 patients. They noted that the use of enteral nutritional support resulted in fewer complications, shorter hospital length of stay, but they did note that there were increased adverse effects secondary to the nutritional intervention itself. That is to say, it is harder to provide the needed calories and proteins using the enteral route. The GI tract is not as easy as the parenteral methodology for providing nutritional support. It takes closer attention to detail. It takes uh, utilizing the enteral route, going more slowly to introduce the nutrients that are required. Back in 1992 at the University of Pennsylvania, we performed a prospective randomized trial in patients with upper GI malignancies, malignancies of the esophagus, stomach, and pancreas. We did so by selecting patients who were malnourished to start, and we looked at the immunologic, metabolic, and clinical outcomes of those patients. It was a relatively small trial, only 85 patients. We randomized patients to receive either standard enteral nutrition delivered via jejunostomy or uh, supplemented uh, enteral nutrition, which was supplemented with a formula that had arginine, RNA, and omega-3 fatty acids. The clinical characteristics and the mean caloric intakes were similar between the groups. However, because of the supplements using arginine, Nitrogen intake and nitrogen balance was greater in the supplemented patients compared with the standard patients. We measured in vitro lymphocyte activity to mitogens in both groups of patients. They, that decreased on day one after their surgery, but it rebounded to normal levels in the supplemented patients compared with those who received the standard formulations. Wound complications, these were particularly infectious complications, were less in supplemented patients, 11%, versus those that received the standard formulation, 37%. And an association with this hospital length of stay was significantly shorter in the supplemented patients versus those receiving the standard diet, which at that time was about 20 days. Remember, this study was done back in 1992. Very different outcome results in terms of hospital length of stay compared with present day. Drover et al. then performed a meta-analysis with the use of arginine supplementation in perioperative patients. There were 28 studies which were reviewed in those analysis, infectious complications were significantly reduced and as well as hospital length of stay in those individuals that received arginine supplementation. However, there was no effect on mortality. Now, this, these authors recognized that these studies covered a span of almost 20 years. And over that period of time, there were advances in discharge management. Remember, back in the days when parenteral nutrition was first utilized, that is 1967 in the early decade of 1970, patients stayed in the hospital. If you had a hernia operation, you remained in the hospital for two to three days. And a woman who underwent a mastectomy for breast cancer, she stayed in the hospital typically five to seven days. We have gone a long way in discharge management. Both of these scenarios that I described would now be done on an outpatient basis. There have also been advances in glucose and antibiotic therapy and in minimally invasive surgery, which now affect current studies. Now, some of the studies that were included have very small sample sizes. They often had more than one intervention. 
And in some, the intervention was used preoperatively, postoperatively, or both pre- and postoperatively. Some studies failed to report data related to infections in a very clear, meaningful way. But despite the limitations, these authors believe the strong signals for a reduction in infections from our analysis cannot be ignored. But again, today, for surgery patients with those individuals undergoing gastrointestinal surgery, particularly those of the upper GI tract, we recognize that prehabilitation is vital. That is, prior to surgery and prior to admission to the hospital, that the individuals receive exercise, nutritional counseling, antibacterial cleansing, they're advised and recommended to stop smoking. And so they get into the best shape that they can possibly be. Perioperatively and postoperatively, we use a minimal opioid based pain control by giving medications in the uh, preoperative area, along with the use of uh, epidural analgesias often early mobilization, early return of GI function by giving uh, oral diet almost immediately, and where it's possible, minimal access laparoscopic surgery, which is certainly being done for esophageal surgery, for gastric surgery, and for pancreas surgery. The nutritional interventions are to avoid fasting, provide for preoperative fluid and carbohydrate loading, and then resuming oral diet on the first postoperative day. But we should recognize that those with upper GI major operations in malnourished patients, and perhaps in those that would be predicted to have postoperative complications, they benefit from postoperative enteral feeding with or without immunonutrition. So for example, how could one predict that a patient might be likely to have a postoperative complication. Well, as Bozzetti and others have shown, in individuals who have a pancreatic cancer, in those that have a soft pancreas, that have a small pancreatic duct, for example, they're much more likely to have leakage from their pancreatic ostomy than an individual with a standard firm sclerotic pancreas with a large pancreatic duct. So one can use the uh, knowledge of what the individual looks like, his or her physiology and nutritional state, as well as the site of the cancer, the size of the cancer, the stage of the cancer, in an effort to determine whether or not they're at risk for postoperative complications. So in conclusion, I would say that nutritional screening and counseling for all cancer patients undergoing therapy should be provided with exercise as practical. The use of oral supplements should be done when they're indicated. Enteral nutritional support should be done when the patient is unable to eat for a week or if less than 60% of their dietary intake for two weeks despite counseling and support. The use of parental nutritional support should be done in malnourished patients when enteral support is unable to be used for a variety of circumstances at the recommended amounts, and one should not use individual mega supplements. Finally, there may be pharmacologic therapy, which can be beneficial for both appetite improvement, weight gain, and a sense of well-being in cancer patients. Thank you very much. Dr. Daly, that was an amazing presentation. And I know I gave you an impossible task to try to summarize uh, the knowledge on the last 30 years in the advances of surgical nutrition uh, for the oncology patients, but you have done an amazing job and you uh, help us uh, recognize that a lot of the things that are thought to be a uh, new and trailblazing you guys were doing uh, with Dr. Dodrick uh, 30 years ago. So I really appreciate your talk and, and I, I, I'll try to uh, 
make him proud with my talk and try to uh, keep the high level of this um, conference. Uh, so let me uh, now start um, with my uh, presentation. I'm going to be talking about nutraceuticals and cancer chemo prevention. Uh, and um, I have these disclosures, but uh, my uh, commitment to this uh, company will not change uh, the uh, content of my presentation. Uh, but before I begin, I'll be remiss if I don't uh, spend at least a couple of minutes uh, recognizing um, the loss uh, that we're mourning uh, over the last couple of months as we've lost uh, two giants in the area of uh, surgical nutrition, uh, in general of nutritional support. Uh, the person that I'm talking about is uh, Dr. Jose Felix Patino, uh, who uh, was one of my mentors uh, back in Colombia and was one of the pioneers in South America uh, of uh, development of uh, nutritional support teams. Um, I won't have enough time today to uh, go over all his recognitions and accomplishments, but I want to focus for a second in one of the things that he cherished the most, and it was the love um, that he uh, shared and the passion that he shared uh, for surgical nutrition with uh, Dr. Dodrich. I, I was lucky enough uh, to be part of some of those conversations and to be the conduit of some of their uh, affection and, and, and messages, um, but it's a, it's a severe loss that we're mourning um, every day, and, and it's just difficult to think that these two giants are no longer with us. But I want to go back to uh, the namesake of our presentation, Dr. Stanley uh, Dodrick. And I had the pleasure of training uh, under him. Uh, and, and not just that, but I uh, got to share um, a lot of things with him. I think I'm the only person uh, that is part of this conference that can say uh, that uh, took his boss to their uh, honeymoon. So this is um, actually a picture of my honeymoon with uh, my uh lovely uh, better half, uh, Dr. Dodrick, and we were in uh, Colombia in um, Cartagena in a national uh, conference of the uh, Surgical Association. Um, and uh, he was there with us, but you can see he had so many adoring fans that he was try to be incognito. Uh, but whoever spent some time with him uh, probably would recognize some of these axioms or just little uh, tidbits that he always will tell you. And he would always say, for example, that when given a choice, I take both. Uh, and he would always uh, make us live by perfection is not optional. And of course, I remember him telling me many times, Jose, when in doubt, just try to think. Uh, but um, more, more um, probably um, common was to hear him saying that he was on a tangent. And we love those tangents because he will teach us so much about life and about nutrition, about his life experiences. But he was not just talk. He would always try to um, share the load with you, and he would try to uh, push uh, the knowledge forward uh, so you can see how he will help you move um, surgical uh, and nutritional uh, therapy forward. And he had a couple of actions that are a little more fitting for my presentation today. Uh, he would love to say that the dumbest gastrointestinal tract is smarter than the smarter physician, surgeon, nurse, dietitian, pharmacist, scientist, or nutritionist. And it was in one of uh, the Aspen meetings in his presidential address that he uh, stated that the ultimate nutritional goal was to provide optimal nutrition to all patients under all conditions at all times. But the corollary to this is that he firmly believes that disease states can be prevented or treated by the appropriate combination of nutrients. And we had many talks about this. And therefore, uh, my presentation. So I'll be talking a little bit about some definitions. I'll be talking about nutraceuticals. And I could have uh, shared uh, many uh, vitamins or uh, macronutrients, and uh, you will basically have a similar um, information that I'm going to give you about vitamin E. I'm going to tell you how you can think in a chemo uh, preventative model and what is the level one evidence that supports using um, the uh, vitamins or nutraceuticals for uh, the prevention of cancer, and finally, uh, future directions and a uh, summary. So to start, uh, chemo prevention was uh, defined by SPORN as the use of a natural synthetic or biologic agent to reverse, suppress, or delay 
the progression of premalignant cells to invasive cancer. And there can be many types of agents, and specifically we're going to be talking about diet-related agents. Moreover, the chemo prevention can be either primary, secondary, or tertiary. Primary chemo prevention is when we want to prevent the initiation of the oncogenic process in the population at large. That is, healthy people that are going to receive a chemo preventative agent that will prevent them developing cancer. The secondary chemo prevention is specifically targeted with premalignant lesions. This will be the progression of cancer in a high risk population. For example, colorectal adenomas, Barrett's esophagus, or some familiar polyposis, uh, or uh, even breast cancer. And the tertiary chemo prevention will be the prevention of new cancers or cancer recurrence in subjects that have already been diagnosed with cancers. This is important as we think in the different strategies for chemo prevention. The next thing that we need to think about is what would be the ideal chemo preventative agent. And if we would have it, we would sell it in every street corner and it would be the universal panacea. We will sell it everywhere, um, but it would be an agent that would work well would be very potent, would be selective, would be easy to deliver, especially oral route, would develop very little resistance, and it would be safe with low to no toxicity. So again, dietary natural compounds would be perfect as a chemopreventative agent. Therefore, the concept of nutraceuticals comes into play. And basically, nutraceuticals uh, is derived from nutrition and pharmaceutics, and basically is the use of foods as medicine. So in other words, is to use foods or part of foods that can provide medical or health benefits for the prevention and treatment of diseases. And this is very important because you can see multiple epidemiologic studies. And again, if you do a search online, you will not have enough time I certainly did it, and I spent uh, many, many weeks just going over uh, some of these agents. Um, but you will have all these different elements that in epidemiologic studies, when people take high dietary um, contents of these elements, there is less evidence of development of cancer. These epidemiologic studies have led us to um, try to design trials in order to be able to use these elements to prevent the development of cancer and in some cases to treat cancer. And why would we do that? It's because there is some molecular basis for this. So in this example, I published in 2015, I specifically speaking about um, head and neck cancers, we can see how the oncogenic pathways are quite complex. And you can see different uh, elements of the oncogenic pathways. And we can see how nutraceuticals, such as vitamin A, the cerebral would be curcumin would be used to prevent the development of the or, or the progression of these oncogenic pathways, and one potentially can think in preventing cancer. To specifically talk about a uh, specifically a specific vitamin, we're going to use vitamin E as a case study. And again, I could have used uh, vitamin A. I could have used vitamin C. Um, and uh, this is uh, the reason why I decided to use vitamin E is because we've used it extensively at Moffitt Cancer Center. I was lucky enough uh, to train and spend significant time in the lab with one of my uh, mentors, uh, colleagues, and partners, uh, Dr. Mokingi Malafa, whose life work has been um, in the development of chemo as preventative agents for a pancreatic, uh, colorectal, and uh, GI cancers overall. But vitamin E is very interesting because it's not one compound, it's actually eight compounds. And this is the molecular um, structure of vitamin E. You can see how it has a chromanol ring and a tail, and depending on the saturation of the tail, will be either a tocopherol or a tocotrienol. It can be alpha, beta, gamma, or delta, depending on the methylation of these positions. So you will have, again, alpha, beta, gamma, and delta. Uh, there is not uh, the, there is no defined receptor in the body for vitamin E. Uh, and it's important to know that alpha tocopherol is the more abundant form and is what is being used for most of the clinical trials studying vitamin E. However, in the laboratory, we use more the tocotrienols, and there seems to be a little better evidence for it. Um, 
But when we look at epidemiologic studies and specifically talking about esophageal cancer, because one is, is one of the areas of my work, um, we can see that in 14 case control studies with about 14,000 um, patients, uh, vitamin E intake, again, this is not administration, intake of vitamin E uh, is associated with decreased risks of development of esophageal cancer, both squamous and adenocarcinoma. So with this in mind, let's talk a little bit about what we've done at Moffitt uh, in uh, Malafa's lab. And what we can see is that we need to go initially to see what data is coming from cell lines, because that is a natural, easier first step. And the first thing that I can show you is uh, administering um, delta tocotrienol, again, one of the forms of vitamin E. So I'm going to be talking about just as vitamin E uh, from now on. Uh, but the first thing that we have is we have this um, immortalized ductal pancreatic cells. That means, again, benign cells that were immortalized to continue to grow and that we were able to mutate them to develop KRAS as a pre-malignant model. And we can see how administration of vitamin E in these cells make them die. So again, pre-malignant, quote-unquote, cells will uh, be uh, a lot, um, will be going apoptosis and cell death when administering vitamin E. They will not form microspheres, and we see the same things when we start talking um, about uh, cancer cell lines, like L3.6 um, and PCSC. And those, I'm sorry, those cells, when uh, given uh, vitamin E, will also either not create spheroids, increase the um, apoptosis, and do not create microspheres. Moreover, another pancreatic cell, li cell lines like Miapaca and L3.6 uh, will show decreasing in invasiveness, decreasing in migration, and will show increase in apoptosis. Again, showing us that there is some clinical, there is some preclinical data that serves as rationale to move on to more complex studies. In this case, mice studies, and I, I could show you multiple mice studies, but this was a, a very um, important one that, that we published a few years back, uh, showing us how um, the, for the creation of a triple cross mice, this is mice that were bred to have KRAS mutation, PDX3 mutation, and TP53 mutations. So all these mice will develop cancer at about uh, 16 to uh, uh, 20 weeks of life. And they were genotyped, and if we confirm that they were um, mutant, then um, at four weeks, they will be treated either with vitamin E by mouth by, or a garbage, or the vehicle that we use to uh, uh, dice, uh, to use vitamin E, uh, gemcitabine, or gemcitabine, that is an anti uh, uh, chemotherapeutic agent, or gemcitabine that is vitamin E. And when we sacrifice these mice, we can see what happens to them. So of the animals that received the vehicle, most of them were dead and had to be sacrificed by three months into the experiment. Moreover, if they received gemcitabine, they live a little longer, but still most of them um, were sacrificed earlier. They were not um, doing very well. But the ones that received vitamin E or gemcitabine vitamin E survive a lot longer. Moreover, when we look at the tumors, we can see that the tumor uh, the major tumor sizes were a lot smaller in the ones that received vitamin E, or gemcitabine and vitamin E. And uh, the induction of apoptosis in these tumors was also a lot higher in the ones receiving gemcitabine and vitamin E. So again, this gives us a rationale to think that vitamin E could be active in patients with um, pancreatic cancers. So the next step, was to see what happened in healthy subjects. So multiple doses, this is all studies from Malafa Lab again. Um, and uh, they, they were um, healthy, uh, so healthy subjects that received vitamin E uh, to try to see their pharmacodynamics. And finally, we did this trial where patients that have resectable pancreatic lesions, believed to be pancreas cancers, uh, were designed a three by three design with incremental dose of vitamin E delta tocotrienol. And basically the idea would be 25 patients that had the diagnosis of pancreatic cancer received before surgery for 14 days, uh, increasing doses of vitamin E, and then they underwent surgical resection. And these were the concentrations in blood of those um, vitamin E compounds. And you can see how it starts increasing at about 600 
uh, milligrams a day uh, with no significant changes after that. And if we will compare the doses achieved in blood with the doses needed to kill cells, we can see that we would be achieving um, doses uh, that are reasonable. Uh, moreover, when we look at um, the uh, results uh, in the pathology specimens, we can see how lower doses will uh, cause no damage or no changes in the uh, normal ducts, um, not in the invasive uh, cancer disease. And the slides showing caspase, that means apoptosis activation. Uh, but as we were giving higher doses, the normal pancreatic duct will start to show some induction of apoptosis, and the pancreas cancers would show a 30-40% increase in apoptosis. That means a cancer death. Showing us that there is a signal there, showing that it could be used for pancreatic cancer. So again, this is just one of the um, subjects, uh, one of the uh, vitamins that could be a story, and I could show you very similar uh, slides for vitamin D, for vitamin A, for vitamin C, uh, in uh, different uh, for different researchers' labs. So these lead us to a chemo prevention model where we could think about it in this way. We can have a nutraceutical that we know it works, whatever name you want to put there. We can have the general population, and if we give it to a general population, then people won't develop cancer. Or we can have a population at risk, for example, Barrett's esophagus. We can give a nutraceutical, and then they would develop cancer. Or if the patient already had cancer, and again, we can put any number there, we give the actual treatment, chemotherapy, radiation, surgeries, then we give a nutraceutical, and then we're going to cancer remission. The important thing here will be to find out what would be the name of each nutraceutical and what would be the cancer that we're trying to prevent. So this will make life very easy if we can fill this this um, this uh, graphic there with a different name for different types of cancers. So basically, we would have cured cancer. We're all done, uh, all surgical oncologists and uh, chemotherapy, uh, medical oncologists, and radiation oncologists will be out of jobs. So forgive me to be so, so flippant, but uh, the problem that we have is that uh, despite all this um, epidemiologic data and despite all this um, preclinical data and all this uh, single series, small series data, uh, I'm going to talk to you about the level one randomized clinical trial data that, as you hinted uh, from um, Dr. Daly's uh, talk, uh, is not very encouraging. So the first thing to know is that uh, the NCI has a division of uh, chemo prevention, and they have about 59 uh, active registered trials. And there is a lot of interest to try to find the right supplement that could help us in uh, preventing cancer. And there is four uh, vitamin supplement trials, there is seven natural compound trials, and there is, there is 10 uh, dietary intervention trials. Showing us again that there is a lot of interest, and certainly the data I'm going to show you uh, following uh, will uh, or can change if these trials show a difference to the trials that I'm going to present you. Um, I'm also not going to focus specifically on the trials, but try to do my best to focus on uh, more the uh, review of these trials as there is so much literature in the field. Uh, but I think uh, you're going to see the themes of the literature showing the same over and over and over again. So let's go to the uh, highest level of evidence and probably the more encouraging data. Um, and this is the data for vitamin D. Uh, in this uh, analysis, uh, Cochrane Review in 2014, um, 50,000 patients were analyzed, and the median time uh, of administration of vitamin D was six years. Mostly women uh, were involved in the study. Um, and uh, 16 studies will include data uh, regarding um, the, um, the, the level of vitamin D. Uh, these are the compounds that were tested. And uh, I'm going to introduce here the concept of a relative risk. And basically, um, if we find that the administration of an intervention to a population decreases the um, risk of that disease that we're storing happening or improves mortality, the a relative risk will be low. If it increases mortality or increases the risk of that um, uh, event happening will increase. So what we're going to find is that for vitamin D, there is no evidence that administration of vitamin D in these populations um, decreases the incidence of cancer. Therefore, these were negative trials. Uh, moreover, uh, in uh, the trials that uh, specifically had patients with low vitamin D, there was no evidence 
up of decrease in cancer incidence. Having said that, uh, in uh, in a secondary analysis, and I will be very wary of secondary analysis. It means this was not the primary um, objective of the of the study, but was a subset of patients' analysis. Um, it seems to be a, there seems to be a decrease in all cause mortality uh, in uh, people that receive D3 supplementation, certainly with some increased complications in those patients. I look into a more uh, current um, data set. Uh, this uh, is from 2019, uh, a meta-analysis that includes about four new randomized trials, so about uh, 29 more patients. Again, the population was mostly female uh, and were mostly in the uh, late 60s. There was no reduction in cancer incidence when evaluating uh, the people receiving vitamin D. So again, the same thing keeps coming over and over, that is that there is no decreased incidence with the administration of vitamin D. There was some um, a statistical um, study uh, of the data, and there seems to be a non-statistically significant reduction in cancer-related mortality in the ones that receive vitamin D. But again, as I've been telling you for a couple of slides, I'm very, very wary of... Um, secondary analysis that is not the primary endpoint of these trials. As um, as you see in the next couple of slides, uh, we, we can be sometimes misled. So let's uh, move on to uh, selenium um, and um, its crazy element. You can see, uh, and it's considered to be a very potent antioxidant. You can see the recommended doses and the doses that we use for the uh, trials. And you can see that out of 12 randomized uh, clinical trials, uh, some different um, vehicles to uh, deliver this selenium were used. Uh, they were uh, in different settings uh, and they study uh, different types of cancer. We clearly uh, did not find any decrease in cancer incident with administration of selenium. Moreover, some trials uh, could have reported some increase in prostate cancer. And again, just keep this in your pocket because we're going to talk it, about it in a little more detail uh, in the next couple of slides. There were some other complications. So again, selenium, no evidence of decreasing cancer incidence. Now let's go to our darling, vitamin E. I showed you all the data um, that um, we have from the lab showing, man, this is going to cure cancer, it's going to prevent it. And again, for me, it's so flippant, but, but that is sometimes how uh, you feel reading those papers. Um, uh, and there is very strong epidemiologic data. Uh, it's important to use, however, it's important to recognize, however, that most of these trials, and if not all, they use tocopherols, not tocotrienols, and that is one of point of contention. But the data we have currently um, sits uh, strongly in two main trials. The first one is the um, alpha tocopherol beta carotene lung cancer prevention study. And this was a very big study, uh, 30,000 men, all smokers at risk of uh, lung cancer who are received alpha tocopherol with beta carotene. Um, and uh, they uh, were supplemented for five to eight years. Uh, and they received, again, alpha tocopherol, beta carotene, and each one separate. Uh, and what was clear is that beta carotene alone actually increased the incidence of lung cancer. So it was not beneficial. It was actually deleterious for the patients. However, uh, there was no difference in the cancer incidence in the people that receive vitamin E. In a sub cell analysis, secondary analysis of this data, vitamin E was found to maybe uh, be associated with decrease in the incidence of prostate cancer. So this led to a, a story that I'm sure all of you guys have heard about, that is the SELECT trial, where selenium and vitamin E were given, and again, uh, this was published in 2009, um, and uh, selenium was used as the dose, as a tocopherol was used as the dose, either was combined or a placebo was given, and 35,000 patients were enrolled. However, of plan 7 to 12 years, the study was stopped early at 4.5 years. And the main problem is that the, the prostate cancer incidence that I showed you was very promising in the prior um, trial actually showed to be increased in this trial. So as you can see in this analysis 
uh, published in 2015. Um, starting at year three, you could see increase in the incidence of prostate cancer. So not just vitamin E was not beneficial, but actually seems to be associated um, with increased risks, the risk of developing prostate cancer. And again, it, show, it should make us very wary of all of those uh, secondary endpoint analysis where uh, we see um, some noise, but we have to remember that wasn't the intention of the trials. And sometimes when you study the data, actually, uh, the, the, the results are, are not what you are expecting. That is why we um, have those studies. And uh, this goes back in the theme of um, Dr. McClay in his talk yesterday um, and um, our president talking about uh, premature factulation, where uh, some noise that is seen in some trials is used as gospel, and then when we actually run the clinical uh, trials, we find that um, the data was not quite so. Moving on to uh, uh, antioxidants, um, you have uh, this meta-analysis, um, and the same thing is seen over and over and over again. Antioxidant administration does not seem to decrease the incidence of cancer, uh, but actually there may be some mild increase in all-cause mortality. Um, so uh, to summarize uh, my data is that uh, despite very strong population dietary studies showing uh, that some dietary intervention can decrease uh, cancer, uh, the administration of nutraceuticals in clinical trials um, and the clinical trials supporting the use of chemopreventative nutraceuticals have not shown consistent clinical benefit, and that is being very generous. Um, Actually, some data suggests that there may be increased cancer incidence, so we need to be extremely careful uh, with this data until better data exists. Um, having said that, there are some meta-analyses uh, and some secondary analyses that may indicate some benefits of certain nutraceuticals in very specific oncogenic processes. Um, so with that in mind, the future directions, um, first of all, need to be that we need to be very cautious uh, when uh, stating the benefits of nutraceuticals for cancer chemo prevention, because the data simply is not there. Second, when designing clinical trials for nutraceuticals, we need to better understand which one are the specifically active compounds that can be used. And we need to take very clear uh, account into what are the endpoints to be evaluated. If it's cancer incidence, then that's what we're going to be talking about, because we need to be wary of secondary analysis that can lead us to the wrong path. Um, having said that, we need to better define what will be ultimate nutrition supplementation. And as you see, the doses are provided of the different vitamins and antioxidants in the trials go all over the place. And they may need to be based on individualized biomarkers that we do not currently have. However, and, and with this I conclude, it's very difficult to believe that a single agent, such as a nutraceutical, could change such a complex process as carcinogenesis. So uh, thank you very much. And um, I will uh, now uh, give the um, forum to Dr. Bill Kramer. Welcome everybody. Uh, it's my pleasure and honor to be a part of this symposium. I thank Dr. Pimento for the invitation and also Aspen for their kindness in allowing me to participate. Uh, disclosures, similar to Dr. Pimento, the AdvoCare Side Med Board. And finally, uh, this, this particular talk uh, is, is really, in with context, is for my dear friend of over almost 17 years, uh, Dr. Dudrick. I really come at this at a very interesting vector, uh, very different from anybody else, from the fact that from many contacts during my time at the University of Connecticut and now the past six years at Ohio State, we always enjoyed talking about things that were different, that were really cutting edge, and that Dr. Dudrick always stressed that we should think outside the box. And my area of expertise as my PhD is in physiology and biochemistry, but my area is with exercise and resistance training and our supplementation and how it might work. And I've been very fortunate thus 
to be able to influence a lot of my postdoctoral fellows and doctoral fellows to be working in the area. So really what I'm going to talk about today is really just the tip of a very big iceberg with the growing knowledge in all areas around the world. So I have two colleagues of mine, former doctoral students and former postdocs, that basically I want to share some of their information with you. And I encourage you, as Dr. Dudrig knew many times, is that great discoveries and great things that happen really occur because of a team of people, not necessarily an indi one individual. Although Dr. Dudrig's finding with the people he's worked with in his roles were just amazing. And I think over the years, I came to appreciate this person as a, as a person and a scientist and a clinician and one who really loved people. And I, again, I'm so honored to be a part of this symposium. But I encourage you to contact the, these two people. First of all, my group at, at, at Ohio State under Dr. Volick, again, former uh, doctoral fellow who's now been working for over 25 years in the field. I'm fortunate to be able to be collaborative with him and do many of the things that he's interested in and push him into areas that uh, I think are important in concert with his line of work on ketosis. Also with Dr. Robert Newton, my postdoc, uh, now at Edith Corwin in Australia. I worked with him for many years and I'm an adjunct at the uh, Edith Corwin University in Perth. And I basically feel excited about taking this biomechanist and what we worked with in physiology and biochemistry. And owing to the fact that his father had prostate cancer, we worked out kind of a program and talked about things that he could do. And he went on to do great things. So both of these people, I uh, had, had acquiesced to their expertise and to what they do. And today, you'll see some of the information that we've worked on together and can look at this whole phenomenon. So if you look at the whole phenomenon, the basically it's a team of people. We see that in Dr. Volick's lab at Ohio State, many different people are working on this whole area of really trying to understand the translational research on how human responses to dietary restriction of carbohydrate really help nutritional ketosis, and this actually is helpful. Dr. Dudrick always was interested in, in new ideas and cutting edges, and this is why I want to show you a little bit today. We know that obesity is really one of the major problems that basically kind of confound and, and have a basis, as you've heard in many talks, relative to cancer. And we also know that the fact that, why does this occur? Why does this really occur? Well, in, in many ways, we've been trying over many, many years to say that, you know, you want to increase the carbohydrates, water, you want to do standard dietary practices. And what this has given us over the years is the fact that it's very possible that carbohydrate and fats do not live well together. And also, when people actually take in more carbohydrate, we see this whole phenomenon of an individualized response or a sensitivity to carbohydrate. And what we now know from many pieces of information are coming up and growing more and more all the time is that fat is kind of innocent. And most people eat too many carbohydrates and refined sugars and processed foods. We also understand that basically in a, in a recent uh, review, is that it may not be that, that, that fat is really the foe it was intended to be, that many times it's because of this association of, of sugar and carbohydrate together with fat as, as really one of the co co confounding variables in many of the studies that try to show that saturated fat was the perpetrator of, of cardiovascular disease and obesity and diabetes. So if we look at the emerging science, there was a large symposium here, and I, I refer you to this, this website, and basically what you can then see is go through a whole host of worldwide uh, experts in the area of ketosis, and the area of diet and nutrition, to get a feeling for this kind of opposite side of the coin that is getting bigger and bigger. And as my wife said many times, there's always two sides of every pancake. Some are thinner than others, but I think research and the ability to study and understand things, how it goes, is very important. And obviously, the individualized approach is so important to anything we do with cancer, nutrition, and exercise. So what we look at with regard to uh, ketosis, 
is that we monitor this with use of ketones and monitoring. And keto adaptation, it, it, a lot of times, is going to take more than just one time or one day. Many of the early studies in exercise and fat used one day. And, and again, it was not going to be an adaptive response. There are many enzymatic systems and everything biologically that has to adjust to a new dietary intake. And I think this is very important that this keto adaptation may take several days and several weeks to really look at what's going on. And now as data is going by and years are going by, keto adaptation over time is really something that's very different. Now, if we look at the well-formulated ketogenic diet that we've used in all of our feeding studies, and this is where we create and feed meals and deliver and, and, and actually verify what's going on, you can see that it really comes down to the fact that carbs are a low portion of the well-formulated ketogenic diet. We see protein is at normal rates. If protein gets too high, it basically is anti-ketogenic. And basically, this has been a mistake that's happened over and over again with many people's misconception of, of the ketogenic diet. It's not a high-protein diet. It's a well-formulated one with normal protein levels and also a variety of fats. So you can see vegetables are important, nuts and seeds, fruits, and miscellaneous all contain in this well-formulated diet. So you can see here that the diet actually has, does have carb restriction, but in fact, what we see has associated the amounts of, of minerals and vitamins and things needed to support it. And fat quality does matter, and saturated fats really don't have to be shied against, it can be embraced. So dietary cholesterol isn't basically a health risk if a properly formulated ketogenic diet is used. And satiety is really one of the features of a properly formulated ketogenic diet. So if we look at the new science of ketones, we know that there's a lot of signaling going on with beta hydroxy, uh, beta hydroxybutyrate with regard to what it does both directly and indirectly and you can see these have benefits. And the understanding of how the ketogenic diet really helps focus this particular signaling molecule is becoming more and more known and having more and more positive effects on the whole phenomenon. So if we look at can diabetes be reversed, uh, a recent study of the, of the group basically looked at this in a kind of non-randomized control but there was the first one to really look at, even on the average of eight years since a type 2 diabetes actual uh, diagnosis, we, they gave the whole phenomenon of looking at these patient populations and did it by a really technological enabled type of phenomenon with regard to diets and managing, as well as the individual based nutrition based on, on the properly formulated ketogenic diet versus just standard care. And we can see that what happened in this particular uh, study was the fact that we found that there were reductions appropriately in the different areas that you would expect with regard to helping one improve their, their diabetic uh, condition. And what you also saw is that weight gain was actually uh, lost. We, had, we got less, we went more weight loss and basically uh, able to maintain it over the period of time. Now, what we see with regard to uh, ketogenic diets and cancer, as Dr. Bullock and the team and myself have seen, is that obesity and type 2 diabetes co actually coagulate together in a Venn diagram to really be promoting different types of cancers throughout the body. And this increase in resist insulin resistance, increase in inflammation, increase in insulin, and increase in glucose really provide kind of a basis for many of the cancer-associated actors that are basically going on with overweight diabetes. And, and, and you can see in the, on, on the right-hand diagram here the different types of cancers that are, have, have basically been promoted in different areas of the body. If we look at basically a recent study that came out in, a, in looking at uh, breast cancer, we looked at uh, ketogenic diet therapy as a co-therapy, and that's important. Diet and nutrition and exercise all work to support cancer medical care. And here they looked at this whole phenomenon and basically came up with some really neat findings. If we look at what 
happened to women undergoing really metastatic breast cancer and chemotherapy, and then looking at how their diet over a six-month period looked at with regard to the properly formulated ketogenic diet, we saw increase in ketones, as you'd expect. We saw decreases in blood glucose, insulin, and HOMA, ear resistance. We saw body weight decrease in fat. We looked at positive testimonials on how they could maintain it and care for themselves. And there was stable or partial regression of some of the tumors that were done by the PET and CT scans and looked at the different criteria that said we had positive aspects. Now, this study was relatively small, but it acted as a very important pilot study, I think, very important study for longer, more advanced trials in, in patients with cancer and in particular breast cancer. If we look at the whole fact that I think many times that the Mole group, and I'm again probably, you know, privileged to be an adjunct part of this whole group in the area of, of endocrinology and exercise, with my area really being resistance training, as you'll see, we now are witnessing kind of an ascension of this idea of nutritional ketosis as a therapeutic modulator to really some of the aspects of chronic diseases that we see. And also, we know that humans evolutionarily are pretty hardwired to burn fat, and thus keto Ketogenic diets allow people to thrive on this and, and, and maximize it. But it takes a whole paradigm shift in behavior, in how you look at food and everything else, and how you combine it. And again, it's individualized because people always have some individual response to a carbohydrate low. And this is important. So we should at least think about providing this type of option in patients and some of the military aspects that I've worked with and also on some athletes that we see with ultra-distance runners now becoming very much using this type of form of, of diet to really not hit the wall with the glycogen depletion that occurs with long endurance type of roles. Now I'm going to twist over here to another former postdoc of mine who I've spent many years with since 1993, and we've worked in, in cognizant with the fact that the construct of the American College of Sports Medicine and the National Strength and Conditioning Association that exercise really is medicine. In fact, a colleague of mine, a physician down in Sydney said, uh, Dr. Kramer, Bill, you know, exercise, especially resistance exercise, is like a therapeutic drug. It activates so many things. And if you go back to Sherrington's idea that the nervous system is so important in trying to understand how the body works and its prolific actions of what happens, you can see here that there's so many endogenous type of medical aspects that actually are driven. You get structural and adaptation or repair. Blood perfusion and vascular adaptations are amazing. And it facilitates and supports other type of therapy and many times can ameliorate some of the side effects. Now, I know in the early studies back in the early 90, late 80s and the early 90s, we looked at resistance training in breast cancer. And one of the things that we found gets kind of lost is that we could trick the body into enhancing CD44 cells because it was used to rebuild muscle and to remodel muscle. And in fact, during chemo and radiation, this was being pushed down. And in spite of that, it came up because it was taking on another task. So we do know that there's a lot of ways that exercise, especially resistance exercise, can play an important role. Now, is this a new thing? No, resistance training uh, has its origins way back into mythology and, 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 and the Greek mythology, and also it's been used in all the different aspects that I've been involved with, whether it be NASA, whether it be the military, competitive athletics, or for fitness, which has been going on for uh, centuries. So realistically, what we see here is that as we look at different populations from young to old, we have aerobic type of exercises on treadmills, bikes, ellipticals. We have resistance type exercise, which here you see some different machines. Although we can use free weights, we can use body weights, we can use elastic bands. The key thing, it's got to be highly individualized to the individual, and you need to have qualified people administering this type of thing. There's so much misinformation, as we know, on the Internet with all the different things that we have to think about that. So we want to know that we have individualized prescriptions that are monitored and basically looked at to optimize the adaptational effects that we see. If we look at aerobic exercise, there's a ton of different ways you can look at aerobic training, all the way from walking, jogging. It's intensity related. 
but we know that intensity plays a very important role in physiological adaptations. So sometimes a lot of now we're looking at <clears throat> moderate intensity training and also higher intensity interval training, which has been very popular now, even in cardiac patients, relative to short, more intense, repeated bouts with rest in between. So we've seen a variety of different things we have to think about here when it comes to, in fact, aerobic exercise prescription, as well as when we look at resistance training. The individual response is very important. Now, one thing I want to point out here, here we see some different machine exercises. And one of the things we look at is that we have to make sure that the resistance load is, in fact, heavy, typically a 6 to 12 repetition range. And in fact, we try to stop without going to complete failure. This is important. Although it's very popular in the vernacular now of fitness and health clubs going to failure, it started way back in the 70s. But the bottom line is, is that for older people, when you go to complete failure, which does happen, it basically creates increased joint stress, increased joint, and you don't need that. So we found and Dr. Newton in our labs has found what we find is we want to train individuals, but though with heavier loads too, meaning 80, 85 percent in some of these loads. Why? Because of the fact you have to activate tissue. Light loads, according to Henneman's size principle, do not activate enough tissue to really get the type of effects that you're looking for. So exercise has to activate motor units to get the majority of tissue to fight some of the sarcopenia, to fight some of the cellular loss, and especially the type of things that are happening when people are battling, getting ready for cancer therapies, battling cancer therapies, and actually in the survivorship of, can of post-cancer. So this is very important. We look at the typical physical activity and cancer framework. You've got to work along this continuum. And that means that, again, individualization really understanding the different phases of the cancer continuum and understanding how you're going to interface and, and change the exercise prescription. Progression, prioritization, individualization of that exercise program has to follow this so that you don't just do the same thing all the time. You have to understand what you're trying to go at and that takes some degree of expertise in this area. Bring in the team. We talk about a book I wrote on evidence-based practice. It's a team of people trying to understand how to deal with the whole phenomenon of caring for that patient population and that individual patient. So what we do know is that exercise, has been mentioned probably many times in the lectures, is very positive. And we see here up when you're up at about three to five hours of moderate to vigorous intensity, you can see that basically that is very important for, in fact, seeing the risk or relative risk from death of breast cancer going down dramatically. Exercise plays an important role. And if we look even in colorectal cancer and cancer survival, physical activity appears to reduce the risk of cancer reoccurrence and actually mortality. It helps. So in fact, many times what we have to look at is the role of exercise, but exercise is not a generality. It's very specific to motor unit activation, to the amount of intensity and, and, and volume. It each has their exercise prescriptions. Again, it's like dosing with a drug. You have to understand how to prescribe it properly. So we again see with uh, Dr. Newton's uh, father and the things he was very interested in, if we look at exercise and, and cancer survival, we can see dramatically that we see the, the, the fact that there's a 61 percent lower risk for prostate cancer death when we have people who are active with greater amount of time uh, spent in individualized exercise programs than not. Now, we also know from large studies that looked at it over time that we see that resistance exercise plays a very big role uh, when it's done. Now, I think this can even be enhanced from what we see here in the diagram from the aerobic center back in the day. So what we see here is the fact that we see that resistance exercise is really just starting to be looked at. And I think Dr. Newton, again, uh, we've encouraged him over many years working with him. This is an area that basically is unbelievably helpful in understanding this whole phenomenon. And I think we've we got to optimize 
training in the weight room as well as complementing it with appropriate cardiovascular functions to do that. And we know from prospective studies and cancer mortality that across all the different type of meta-analyses, you see this actual reduction in active patients. You see the enhancement of what's going on here. And you can say the same thing here for risk occurrence and reoccurrence. We, we just see a positive effect in all the different studies that have been looked at with regard to uh, meta-analyses of looking at how this occurs with regard to the role of exercise. So I think here you can see here that it's even been touted compared to chemotherapy as a major advance, a turning point in eliminating some of the suffering and death from cancer, and that such parallels of cancer reoccurrence and exercise in general can play a very important role but it has to be done properly and very highly individualized and specific, but it can work. So exercise is not an alternative to chemotherapy or medical care, as we've heard about in your medicine, or nutritional care, which is also an adjunct. It's synergistic. It's part of the synergistic phenomenon that you can use both to prepare people for surgery, both to look and see how they can fight the different processes. <laughs> So you can see here in this particular investigation that we can, in fact, use properly developed exercise and resistance training, plyometrics, landing. You can see in the plyometric things helps with bone development, helps with bone maintenance. You can see also with regard to power and movement in everyday activities. So resistance training is a composite of different things that allow people to understand how you can functionality can be improved, how you can be more physically fighting any type of sarcopenia. And it has a host of different physiological mechanisms that are related to positive aspects relative to the adjunctive care in cancer. So I think we're starting to understand that all these underlying biological mechanisms play big roles in both the treatment and care and the adjunctive aspect of exercise and nutrition to basically help the whole phenomenon of the cell. And I think this is what was really fascinating with Dr. Dudrick, really interested as a former athlete and interested in exercise. This is a whole domain that we, he and I talked about so many times. And he was so, again, it was just amazing talking about this. Now, the other thing here, what we, what we have with exercise, and especially resistance exercise, we can work on muscle mass by recruiting that tissue forcing protein synthesis. We can see that, in fact, we see differences and we see this association. So the combination of ketogenics which, and, and resistance exercise and aerobic exercise, we fight the different factors that are going on, especially here, the challenge for muscle mass. And we can see here that there's a great deal of aspects when we look at fat mass and looking at muscle as it relates to a risk of dying. And we know this. And again, here is where proper exercise programming can help this on a variety across the lifespan. And this is what's so important when we look at how to use this as adjunctive care. So the results and recommendations really come down to the fact that we, we have greater risk of dying with sarcopenia. Obesity is basically greater. So we have to have resistance exercise and supplementation. And caloric restriction in, case, in some cases for weight loss, but really a proper ketogenic diet, if appropriate, to help in patient care. This has been talked about with regard to the different organizations, American College Sports Medicine, the Australian Physician Stand and Exercise, and we see many different aspects. Without going through a laundry list, there's many ways to help in the different phases of care of the prescription. And what you'd end up seeing here is that it's partly involved in all the areas relative to the whole continuum of care that we, is what we're talking about. And finally, a couple things. You need good assessment. You need to identify the priorities, goals, and then you need to have the proper care and capacity and the intervention. So we've done everything from home programs to facility programs to clinical programs, and you have to have the right prescription, and that's very important. And you got to deal with changes over time. And this goes through the whole phenomenon, the general health and fitness. And finally, you look at, there are indi contraindications. The American College of Sports Medicine puts this out. These are things where otherwise you're good to go. You can't have 
such things as unstable angina, severe symptomatic aortic stenosis. The medical aspect of the team needs to make sure that these type of contraindications don't exist and we can get good to go. So everybody has to have proper supervision no matter what the stage of care is over the period of time so that basically prescriptions of exercise and nutrition are appropriate and setting goals. So finally, I want to thank you. The tip of a very big iceberg, those two experts and former students uh, who are great uh, working in this area, I'm uh, very honored to work with them. I also am very honored to be a part of this. I thank Dr. Pimento for thinking of me. I thank Dr. Dudrick for all his conversations. And I think it's just going to be a great phenomenon that you can carry on this tradition. Thank you very much. So, Bill, that was absolutely incredible. Uh, this is just to highlight a little bit uh, the um, fact that we need to get a little uncomfortable and that we need to start working with different um, disciplines in order to be able to make significant progress in cancer care, and this is just a highlight of that. So with this, I want to uh, welcome uh, Dr. Stephen Hersting. Uh, please uh, go ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everyone. I uh, also want to express my appreciation to Jose and to the Aspen organizers. Uh, it's really an honor to join you from my kitchen in Chapel Hill uh, and talk about obesity and cancer. Uh, I have not, uh, nothing to disclose, uh, but I will, uh, in the next 20 minutes or so, explore with you the human and animal model evidence for the association between obesity and cancer. Uh, we'll then uh, describe some of the established and emerging mechanisms uh, that uh, underlie this obesity cancer link. And, uh, and then the bulk of our time, I'd like to talk about maybe some new targets and strategies to mitigate the pro-cancer effects of obesity. Uh, one of the uh, most fulfilling initiatives I've uh, been involved with has been the American Institute for Cancer Research, World Cancer Research Fund uh, expert report process uh, that began in 1997, actually before that, um, first report in 97. I got involved in 98 and have been involved in the last two reports. And these are uh, really um, rigorous systematic reviews and meta-analyses of the world's literature uh, on uh, uh, really all the major dietary factors uh, and their connection with all the major cancers. And uh, this includes also physical activity uh, as well. Uh, and so the one thing, the data has improved over the years, where in 97 it was largely case control data, 2007 report was really a mix. And the, the most recent report about a year and a half ago uh, was almost exclusively uh, prospective cohort data or clinical trial data. And one of the key findings that emerged from uh, this initiative was the importance of obesity in uh, a number of cancers. And so you, you hear this number, 12 or 13 cancers associated with, with, with obesity. And this, this uh, 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 largely comes from this, this AIC or WCRF initiative. Um, and, and Dr. Kramer mentioned that it really spread across the body. Uh, of, of, of the impact of obesity on cancer really is, is quite strong. Um, this has led the, the top line recommendations uh, for uh, nutrition, physical activity, and cancer prevention. Um, really, uh, at least I interpret uh, largely a, a you know kind of a weight control focus here. So be a healthy weight, be physically active, as we just heard about the importance of exercise. Eat a diet rich in whole grains, vegetables, fruits, and beans. Limit consumption of fast foods and other processed foods, high in fat, starch, sugar. Limit uh, consumption of red and processed meat. Limit consumption of sugar-sweetened drinks. And limit alcohol consumption. Uh, now, one thing, uh, certainly the field uh, is, is uh, really, really uh, urgently trying to move beyond these more kind of one-size-fits-all recommendations to get more precise about both the exposures and the the susceptibility, the individual susceptibility and a more precision nutrition sort of approach. And that's, that's certainly something we, we are active, uh, actively pursuing. This is, this is really important. These, these sort of one size 
uh, you know, are, are, are not going to get us all the way there. Uh, but you can see, you, you know, certainly reflected in these recommendations, the, uh, the emergence of obesity as a, as a major risk factor. Um, consistent with this, the uh, International Agency for Research on Cancer also uh, set us uh, about uh, uh, assessing the uh, body fatness, obesity, cancer connection uh, using a different approach. And I, I was honored to be a part of this effort as well. Um, really running, uh, if you will, obesity through their carcinogenesis assessment protocol. Uh, very interesting exercise uh, to do. Uh, there were three teams. There was an epidemiologic team led by Graham Kolditz and Rudolf Katz, uh, from, who uh, is at, uh, at uh, 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 the uh, IARC as well. Um, and, and what um, the, this team found was a very similar picture to what the uh, AICR WCRF report showed, uh, where in this case 13 cancers were identified, the, the same 12 uh, from the AICR effort. Uh, this group found meningioma as well uh, as a 13th uh, obesity associated cancer. So, so a different approach, really running through the, the literature through their uh, IR uh, carcinogenesis protocol, uh, but a similar finding. The strength here is, is, is uh, remarkable. Uh, this, this obesity cancer connection. The second part of the, uh, this, of this effort was to look at whether intentional weight loss in obese people might reduce risk of some cancers. Like, like we know it, it, it appears to do with, with diabetes. A, a little weight loss goes a long way, for example, in type 2 diabetes. Uh, it, does, does weight loss uh, following a chronic uh, obesity um, situation, does that reverse the, the pro-cancer effects was one of the questions. And unfortunately, uh, there, there was some evidence for, uh, for the reversibility based primarily on bariatric surgery data, and I'll, we'll talk about that in just a moment. Uh, but the number and quality of weight loss studies was really deemed insufficient for formal evaluation of this, of this situation from, from the epidemiologic uh, data. Uh, that's a major gap, and we'll, we'll talk, certainly that'll be a major focus of our discussion today. Uh, I was part of a team looking at evidence from animal models, and uh, what was found was obesity consistently promotes cancer in rodent models of the same cancer type shown to be associated with obesity in, in people. Uh, the number of studies for many sites was limited, uh, but the picture uh, fairly consistent with, with the human data. Uh, perhaps a stronger picture was the other side of the coin. Um, there was sufficient evidence in experimental models for a cancer preventive effect of calorie restriction, uh, which we heard just a little bit about uh, from, from Dr. Kramer, uh, which prevents obesity. And, and this, was, this was evident for many cancer sites. So, uh, so calorie restriction, a strong anti-cancer intervention. Uh, and uh, again, we were tasked with looking at the preclinical evidence for intentional weight loss and the reversibility of obesity. And once again, there were very limited data uh, regarding this. Um, some data, and, and we, we, I'll show you some of ours, uh, that if severe enough, uh, it does look like uh, you know, reversing uh, through dietary or, or dietary physical activity uh, combinations uh, can reverse the pro-cancer effects of, of a chronic obese uh, sort of situation. Uh, but again, a, a major gap in the field, and this is something we really, really need to turn our attention to. Uh, there was also a mechanistic team, uh, and, and I'll, I'll just show you kind of the results. We, we identified, I was part of this as well, we identified established and emerging mechanisms uh, underlying this, this link. We've heard a little bit about this already, but obesity, uh, certainly ch uh, changing systemic metabolism to a great extent. And so you see insulin hyperinsulinemia, increased IGF-1, uh, change in adipokines, leptin adiponectin ratio particularly greatly increased, uh, obesity, a, a chronic pro-inflammatory state, so you see a number of cytokines, chemokines uh, elevated in the obese state. Uh, factors such as plasminogen activator inhibitor, uh, one uh, in, involved in vascular regulation also altered, and, and sex steroids, uh, estradiol, for example, uh, important for a number of sex steroid-related cancers, elevated. Uh, and so we know that the uh, growth factors, insulin IGF-1, for example, signal through uh, a receptor tyrosine kinase pathway. So we see enhanced growth factor signaling, 
particularly the uh, uh, PI3 kinase AKT uh, mTOR, mammalian targeted rapamycin pathway, uh, and, uh, and so the strong evidence that this, this uh, signaling, particularly through the mTOR signal, uh, is involved in obesity-associated cancer risk and progression. And I'll, I'll show a little data on that in a moment. Clear evidence for pro-inflammatory effects of obesity, kind of a chronic low-level smoldering, if you will, inflammation, but it doesn't resolve is, is the challenge. And that clearly, through signaling, um, particularly NF-kappa-B uh, pathway and the cyclooxygenase 2 prostaglandin uh, pathway, uh, strongly linked to increased cancer risk and progression and obesity driving that. And there are also vascular perturbations. We see increased angiogenesis uh, with obesity, uh, primarily through the, uh, the, the upregulation of VEGF and, and signals related there. So, so multiple established pathways for this obesity cancer link, uh, as well as several emerging stories. So uh, we found evidence um, of, of, a, of an obesity associated reprogramming of microbiome, uh, really a dysbiosis uh, occurring. Um, not, a, not a, a lot of evidence yet, so that this is, this is an emerging area, but clearly obesity changing that compartment and uh, likely the metabolites of the microbiota uh, driving inflammatory and other signals uh, is, is emerging as an important component. There's also adipose remodeling, a shifting in, in the really the types of adipose as well as the cellularity within adipose uh, compartments uh, is, is an emerging story. And particularly in relation to the immune system and the, the uh, uh, invasion, the, the uh, incorporation of, of immune cells into adipose tissue and changing the biology uh, is, is an emerging story, but again, not, uh, not quite yet established. And uh, I think something uh, would perhaps combined inflammation and fibrosis, some of the, some similar signaling occurring, but there does seem to be a, a clear pro-fibrotic effect of obesity, and that's that will impact uh, certainly not only the development of cancer, but but in particular the response to therapy appears to be uh, impacted by that process, uh, and so that's uh, that's an emerging story. Uh, there is epigenetic reprogramming, uh, DNA methylation, histone modifications, changes in microRNA associated with obesity, uh, again, emerging as important. And I'll show a little data that uh, suggests that chronic obesity through epigenetic reprogramming uh, may be just a little bit challenging to reverse. And that may be why some of the, uh, some of the evidence that is emerging about maybe moderate weight loss uh, sort of in, in, in effectively reversing the pro-cancer effects of obesity may be occurring because of this, uh, we have to overcome this epigenetic reprogramming uh, that, that obesity is driving. A lot of interest in immune uh, uh, and cancer uh, relationship, and as we have checkpoint inhibitors and other immunotherapies emerging, uh, we were, we're learning a lot about, uh, about this, this connection. Um, does obesity impact immune uh, effects? And it certainly does. Um, and in fact, uh, obesity is emerging as a essentially an immunosuppressed sort of sort of setting. Uh, we see that uh, in, in our models where we see evidence of T cell exhaustion, T cell exclusion, immunosuppression in, in the, the obese microenvironment. And so this, again, not a lot of data yet on this. Uh, even uh, uh, we're starting to see a number of grants come in about obesity and its effects on on the immunotherapy responses. Uh, but this is this is an emerging area for, uh, for sure. And then one final piece I'll touch on is a concept that's emerging about uh, we, we refer to as metabolic tone, which is sort of the the the, the symphony or the if you will the resonance between uh, the the systemic me uh, metabolic state. Um, that obesity manipulates, uh, and, and the uh, actual cancer cell metabolic state, the Warburg kind of metabolism that's characteristic of many cancer cells. And, and indeed, we're seeing that uh, you know, these factors like uh, hyperinsulinemia and insulin resistance and shifts in growth factors and the dipokines does seem to impact and, and really drive the more Warburg kind of shift from, uh, from oxidative phosphorylation to glycolysis and, and a shift in fuel utilization. And so, uh, so that there, there does seem to be a, 
a connection between the systemic metabolic changes and, uh, and cancer cell metabolism. Uh, and so these are all contributing to cancer risk and progression. Uh, and certainly there's more to learn about, uh, about the mechanisms, and, and this is an active area of research linking obesity and cancer. Uh, but one, uh, and, and, I'll, and I'll just sort of, sort of highlight some of the, some of the evidence underlying uh, some of these connections. We've, we've worked particularly hard on uh, the uh, causal relationships between obesity, growth factor signaling, and a number of cancers. And uh, kind, of, uh, kind of, we kind of got our start looking, we were comparing lean mice that we can make by uh, a calorie-restricted diet. Uh, diet-induced obese mice uh, using a high-fat, high-calorie diet-induced obesity regimen, uh, or the kind of usual uh, ad libitum-fed overweight uh, group, and compared them in terms of their their growth factors, and, and just characteristically, uh, we looked at IGF-1 insulin, uh, adipokines like leptin and adiponectin, and that ratio has really emerged as an important one. Uh, inflammatory, circulating inflammatory factors like IL-6 and tumor uh, growth. In, 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 our, in several models, I'll, I'll just show an example from our basal-like breast cancer model that we've been doing a good bit of work with. So in the lean calorie-restricted state, you see low IGF-1, uh, you know, no hyperinsulinemia under nice control. Leptin adiponectin ratio is low, uh, and uh, inflammatory cytokines also low. And this is a situation where tumors develop, develop late. Uh, they, grow, they grow slowly and, uh, and tend to not be uh, particularly aggressive. So a, sort of a, a low level of, of, of cancer susceptibility in that state. In contrast, the obese state, you see high IGF-1, insulin really hyperinsulinemic, res, insulin resistance uh, certainly there. That leptin adiponectin ratio has shifted dramatically, uh, beginning to see a number of cytokines and chemokines uh, elevated, IL-6 being characteristic. And this is a situation for rapid tumor growth, uh, early development, progression, uh, to metastatic disease, uh, so so a, a really a pro-cancer so, sort of setting. And the overweight uh, uh, control group here is really intermediate to the lean and, and the obese. Uh, so a number of factors involved. How do we start to sort these out? And so something we, we worked on uh, quite a bit in, in both normal and tumor tissue and skin, liver, prostate, colon, pancreas, and, and mammary uh, was this relationship between the, the growth factors changing with obesity and, and, the, and the, the pro-cancer effects of obesity. So I mentioned insulin and IGF-1. They, the, uh, they signal through uh, receptor tyrosine kinase pathway, particularly the PI3 kinase, AKT mTOR. Uh, and this is very much a central player at mTOR in uh, regulating protein translation, nucleotide production, uh, all, all components really of, of daughter cell production so important in, 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 the, in the cancer, particularly the metabolic uh, regulation of cancer. And so this is a central player. And what we found was that obesity uh, really increases the steady state signaling through, the, uh, through these growth factor signaling pathways. Every, every component, each kinase is, is phosphorylated to a, to a greater extent, seeing, seeing greater signaling, uh, certainly increased protein translation. We're seeing more nucleotide production. Uh, and so this is this is a really kind of driving driving this system uh, in, in an upregulated way. In contrast, calorie restricted decreases the signaling through each step of the pathway, uh, and, and we see decreased protein translation, decreased ribon, uh, decreased nucleotide production in response to the restricted state. Uh, just to begin to kind of sort out well, what might be underlying these effects. Uh, again, focusing on the IGF one and insulin mTOR type of signaling, uh, in, in, a, in an obese setting, if we block uh, either the IGF receptor or the insulin receptor or mTOR itself, uh, even though the mice are still obese, uh, that, that mimics the calorie-restricted effect through this pathway, and it also mimics the anti-cancer effects. And if we in, instead in lean mice uh, activate these pathways, increase IGF-1 receptor activity or insulin receptor or mTOR uh, these mice mimic the obese state in terms of this, this signaling and, uh, and really cancer susceptibility, despite being lean. And so uh, this, this was beginning to kind of clarify that while obesity and the uh, uh, you know, kind of changes in, in adipose tissue are certainly a trigger for many of these effects, 
that might not be the solution. It's, it, it really probably is this persistent metabolic change uh, that might be the main target. And, uh, and certainly this, this pathway seems to be one of the, one of the targets um, underlying this connection. The, uh, the other established mechanism uh, is this obesity and inflammatory story. And so we know as, a, as adipocytes accumulate triglyceride, their secretome dramatically changes, becomes, becomes pro-inflammatory. And these, these uh, uh, triglyceride-filled adipocytes start dumping a number of cytokines and chemokines and free fatty acids. Uh, in, uh, and this is a really a, a, a pro-inflammatory trigger uh, in, in this microenvironment. Uh, as, the, uh, as that microenvironment changes, uh, macrophages and other immune cells are attracted in to clean up the mess, really. Uh, they become hypoxic. They increase collagen deposition and fibrosis. fibrosis. So there's, pr there's part of the fibrotic mechanism mentioned. And it really uh, dramatically augments the pro-inflammatory environment. So you get this cascade of inflammation going. So again, I, I, I think an important trigger is this, is this uh, accumulation of triglyceride in, in the obese state. Um, but really, once that cascade gets going, um, it may be other, other components, and particularly the inf inflammatory and, and uh, growth factor-related signaling uh, that become the main targets. So lots to learn still about mechanism, but I, one thing that I think a, a message from the IARC and AICR initiative is that we, we really as a community need to pivot from the question of whether obesity is a risk factor for many cancers. It certainly is. Uh, to the question of how will we reduce the impact of chronic obesity on cancer. And, and I will say there are more questions and answers here. This is a major gap, as I mentioned, in the field uh, and something that we really need to focus on. So we'll, we'll spend the rest of our time uh, kind of going through some of, the, some of the key questions. And so does intentional weight loss following obesity uh, reverse the pro-cancer effects? And uh, I think I alluded to this, that no, there, there is a persistence of, of, of both AKT mTOR signaling and inflammatory signaling and cancer susceptibility even after weight, uh, the uh, obesity uh, state has, has, been, has been reversed. Now, we can partially address this with uh, targeting mTOR or targeting inflammatory, uh, but it's, it's, it, we, we don't get all the way there. Uh, and there's this persistent effects uh, that, that, that remains. Uh, here, here's one, one uh, piece of evidence from that. These were control mice, low tumor susceptibility, obese mice, tremendous tumor susceptibility. And uh, reversing the obese state after about 20 weeks of the diet-induced obesity regimen back to the control weight, uh, these, we call these the formerly obese mice, th in this case via a low-fat diet, did not reverse the pro-cancer effects of obesity. And so that, uh, 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 you know, what, what might be underlying that? Again, we, we, we think the, uh, the uh, epigenetic reprogramming is, is a part of this, and we do see microbiome changes as well with obesity that are not reversed. Um, but that, that's not the most encouraging story, is it? So, uh, so again, going back to the epidemiologic literature, weight loss surgery does reduce risk of a number of cancers in morbidly obese patients. And so... Uh, this paper by Shower and colleagues is one example here where all, all cancers reduced about a third. You see pancreatic, endometrial, and postmenopausal breast in about half uh, reduction in, in Herzog ratio uh, in re following uh, of, of, of bariatric surgery. Might we be able to bring that into our mouse models was a question and try to reverse this effect. And so so again, we have uh, kind of a similar setup with um, control, obese, seeing a, a big uh, increase in tumor, tumor progression uh, in, in one of our uh, breast cancer models. We've done this in a number of model systems. Again, the low-fat diet, former obese group, did not reverse uh, the pro-cancer effects. A more severe restricted diet, however, did. So this is a high carbohydrate calorie restriction, 30% uh, reduction in calorie intake, so fairly severe uh, cow restriction regimen did reverse the pro-cancer effects. Uh, also, a moderate carbohydrate cow restriction. So this is a this is a high carb, low fat. This would be a, uh, a, a kind of a kind of a moderate carb, high fat uh, regimen, uh, as well as an intermittent cow restriction. So a five two diet, five days of a healthy kind of Mediterranean type of diet, two days of a low fat, low carbohydrate diet, uh, equally effective. 
Uh, we compared this uh, more recently with a sleeve gastrectomy intervention in our mouse models, and and it was even more effective. It reduced uh, even below the the intermittent calorie restriction levels. So, so yes, it, uh, the obesity effects are reversible. Uh, how best to do that? Um, we're not going to solve it with 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 bariatric surgery, uh, and and probably not going to solve it with calorie restriction either. Such a such a difficult regimen to to maintain. But can we learn lessons mechanistically from these and mimic them uh, through diet, physical activity, even some pharmacology combination regimens? And so that's a major, major uh, effort now. We've, we've been throwing every omic uh, we can think of at this to try to understand what, what are the, the underlying uh, anti-cancer effects of these effective interventions. Particularly, we are reversing the epigenetic change. We are uh, dramatically changing metabolism and, and the secret tome uh, from, from this. And so, uh, so there are some lessons that we're learning. And our goal is to develop diet, exercise, pharmacologic regimens that can really mimic the metabolic effects, the anti-cancer effects of these interventions uh, without doing the surgery is, is really the goal. Um, there are some really interesting emerging approaches to metabolic reprogramming interventions, uh, M- MRIs, we refer to them, uh, some of these are diet, and, and, and Dr. Kramer and uh, has introduced some of this already with intermittent restricted diets or ketogenic diets. Um, uh, Walter Longo has established some some regimens for fasting or a fasting mimicking diet. Uh, also, time restricted feeding looks very interesting, where all of your calories are consumed in an eight hour period, and you, you really have an extended fasting period almost seems to be independent of the number of calories consumed. There's, there's a, a protective effect there and an anti-inflammatory uh, effect. Uh, and also some data emerging about one carbon nutrient restricted diets, particularly methionine as a, as a way to, uh, to intervene and, and uh, metabolically reprogram the situation. We've also been looking uh, primarily in vitro at this point, moving now into in vivo uh, with, with and without chemotherapy is, one of our one of our questions is Dr. Kramer said we're going to we're going to need to combine these efforts uh, with with our conventional uh, therapeutic approaches, uh, but the IGF one receptor insulin receptor mTOR inhibitors are showing a, a lot of promise here. Uh, Cox inhibitors, in, JAK stat inhibitors in the inflammatory uh, realm, uh, glutaminase inhibitors also showing some promise. Um, that seems to be part of the metabolic reprogram with obesity. Uh, and so if we can block that, <clears throat> we are seeing some effects, as well as autophagy inhibitors, uh, uh, looking at, uh, in particular, uh, improving chemotherapeutic response. Uh, that's an area that gets us to our second question of uh, how do we overcome obesity-associated resistance to many ke- chemotherapies? This is a part of the obesity epidemic and, and it's linked to cancer that's been, I think, underappreciated is uh, uh, obese, uh, many obese patients are, are less responsive to, to chemotherapy, um, and that's across a number of cl- classes. Uh, a, a number, number of uh, investigators are, are trying to look at some of the uh, uh, cow restriction, fasting, fasting-mimicking diet, you know, these metabolic reprogramming interventions in the context of therapy. And the idea is maybe uh, with these uh, reprogramming interventions, we can slow normal cell growth down, uh, protect them, uh, from the particularly cytotoxic chemotherapy, uh, while uh, possibly still be able to target effectively the tumor cells. And in fact, what's emerging is, uh, if anything, there's increased sensitivity to antimitotic agents uh, in response to these metabolic reprogramming interventions. There's also changes in the tumor microenvironment, and particularly the desmoplasia fibrosis is decreased, uh, and, in, and that enhances drug delivery. And uh, reduced substrate availability, reduced growth factor signaling, reduced inflammation uh, really helps the circulatory uh, kind of story here. Uh, and so, uh, so this is a very promising area and, and lots of work being done, lots of grants coming through in, the, in that. Uh, real quickly, I'll, I'll wrap up with kind of two other questions. Um, underappreciated as well is the effect of obesity on metastasis, and that's really the deadly part of cancer, uh, but quite understudied. Uh, and uh, what we have found is uh, a, a clear connection, a strong pro-metastatic, perhaps even stronger uh, than, than its effects on primary tumor, at least in our models. And one model we've set up is a, 
uh, uh, it based back on that went uh, basal-like breast cancer model, which does not metastasize to a great extent. We have a uh, the, sort of the parental uh, line. Uh, we have lines that are uh, highly metastatic uh, to the lung or to the liver. And what we noticed, what was different in terms of gene expression uh, from the metastatic versus non-metastatic was largely an inflammatory story, uh, particularly related to uh, COX-2 prostaglandins, leukotrienes, uh, and those types of signals. Uh, and so we, uh, we uh, compared the effects of obesity as well as uh, the possible anti-metastatic uh, effects of Sulindac, the uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug that, that mimics uh, some of the effects of aspirin, really. Uh, and what we found was in, in, in multiple model systems, obesity, a very strong pro-metastatic factor compared to control, uh, and Sulindac pretty effective uh, in each of these models at reversing some of these uh, pro-metastatic effects of obesity here in EO771, a, a basal-like breast cancer model as well that develops lung METs. Uh, uh, our our METM went lung model. Um, again, obesity is a strong driver. Sulindac really reversed the, 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 that metastatic effect. Uh, and I thought this was interesting. We have this liver line, uh, and uh, we, we uh, you know, see this phenomenon of, of tissue tropism. Uh, where typically uh, a, a lung, a lung, a line derived from a lung metastasis will only go to lung. A line derived from a liver metastasis only goes to liver. That's sort of a, a metastatic phenomena in the preclinical world. Um, uh, we've, we've actually broken that rule with obesity. It seems to uh, allow uh, liver mets to establish in the lung. And I think it speaks to the change in the microenvironment uh, associated with obesity that's driving metastasis. So again, we're seeing we're seeing obesity really driving uh, uh, lung metastases from this liver line as well as from the lung line. And again, the the, the anti-inflammatory uh, drug reversed um, this this pro pro metastatic effect. Uh, finally, uh, we'll, um, I think this is more of an aspirational sort of uh, uh, slide here. Can we better integrate cell culture, animal model, and human research? in obesity and cancer. I think this is something we need to do better to accelerate our translational progress here. Uh, we've got evidence certainly from cells, animals, humans, and, and population level. Can we better integrate, uh, and particularly lessons from, from mechanism and move that up the chain to, to clinical and population research? And, and lessons from population human research, can we better model those in animals? And I'll just give one example uh, we've, we've been trying to do uh, a co-trial approach, we call this, where we integrate human and mouse nutritional intervention trials. For example, in a number of cases, we've taken obese, sedentary, high cancer risk uh, women or cancer patients, breast cancer patients, uh, as well as obese cancer-prone mice. Uh, in the women, we get body composition, biospecimens at baseline. Same with the mice. We introduce a behavioral or pharmacological intervention in both. Now we're much faster in the animal in the animal world, so we can assess biomarkers uh, in the in the subset of animals, allow the rest to progress, document their cancer, establish biomarkers that predict their cancer, and even come back and improve causal connections between them. While our, our clinical colleagues are, are accruing, uh, it typically takes five years or so for that to occur, and by the time they've got their repeat body composition and biospecimen collection. Uh, our, our goal is to have a, a really nice set of biomarkers to bring uh, to that to that human uh, uh, study. And we've done this for a number of things. We're, again, we're finding the anti-inflammatory drugs, uh, some of these intervention diets, omega-3 fatty acids showing some effect, particularly in the inflammatory side. Uh, so we're having some success, I think, in, in, in translating uh, back and forth and learning from, from both systems, from the human as well as the, the animal. Uh, to accelerate this. So I'll stop here. Uh, here are my students uh, currently. Where I'm, I'm based primarily at the uh, UNC Gilling School of Global Public Health, Department of Nutrition there. Uh, we also have a Nutrition Research Institute and uh, have a, a, a group of postdocs out there primarily uh, driving the, some of the metabolic and, and genetic work uh, related to obesity and cancer. So I'll stop there. Here are my uh, collaborators and funding. Thank you very much again for, for the opportunity to participate and uh, look forward to your questions. Thank you.
So, Dr. Hershing, this was an amazing, amazing uh, presentation. I think uh, it kind of, uh, we were able to go full circle. Uh, and uh, we have some uh, very interesting questions to uh, bring um, to the to all the uh, speakers. Uh, so um, let's uh, start uh, with uh, a very um, interesting question, and it's uh, the fact that uh, how come it was seen? Uh, we're talking about all these effects of um, obesity uh, for development of cancer. Uh, how come we're seeing so many patients, uh, especially with GI cancers, pancreatic cancers, colorectal cancers that are malnourished? So how do we uh, round the square peg? And uh, I would like to open that for all, uh, for uh, everybody. Uh, I know all of us have very strong uh, feelings about uh, that um, statement. So I don't know, Dr. Daly, you want to start it? And then maybe uh, Dr. Hersing. Sure. So uh, I think, you know, we see as a general phenomena in the U.S. particularly and in other Western countries, obesity. Uh, there's no question about that. And uh, as it is a risk factor for the development of cancer, uh, we see that occurring. So what you see is a malnutrition that develops with a loss of protein, uh, loss of muscle mass, uh, there's some loss of fat mass as well, but it's not the, it is not the marasmus that you think about in underdeveloped countries from uh, lack of nutrients. So uh, we see malnutrition that's more, not quite quasi core, but we see malnutrition with body weight in excess of what should be normal, but that's fat weight and not muscle weight, and it's not um, circulating proteins. Normal. Yes. Uh, awesome. Uh, what about the first thing? Yeah. Yeah, I'll just add to that that um, uh, one thing we're saying. So, so obesity um, is is certainly a risk factor for sarcopenia, and um, and so uh, you know you do see this decrease in lean mass and and kind of <clears throat> aberration in muscle metabolism associated with obesity, and that's emerging as a as an important. Um, predictor of cachexia uh, later on in, in cancer patients. And so, um, I, you know, I, that, that's something we, we've just begun to start to look at that um, picture in our model systems. And we indeed see that, the you know, chronic obesity really, you know, really driving uh, alterations in muscle biology that seems to uh, be, make the, the, the animals as they develop cancer and and in some cases develop sarcopenia that makes them more susceptible to a severe sarco uh, cachexia. So, um, so I think that, that this is, we have not paid enough attention, I think, to the muscle side of things. It's been so focused on fat and circulating factors, uh, but muscle really needs to be, uh, be brought into the, into the center of these, uh, these types of investigations in my view. Well, I, I, th I think you're right, and I think uh, and I think uh, it's also important to understand that not every single cancer patient is the same, and we kind of uh, put cancer all together. Uh, but again, it's a little different situation when you have a non-metastatic breast cancer patient, a non-metastatic colorectal patient versus an end-stage uh, uh, colorectal patient or end-stage pancreatic patient. So those are different populations. Um, but I think I, I want to just echo a little bit what um, Dr. Daly was talking about that that we need to uh, aggressively uh, uh, intervene on the patients that are acutely presenting with malnutrition to our practices. Um, but in the patients that are not acutely malnourished, uh, then a combination of um, changing diets, increasing exercise may be very important for their long-term outcomes and the cancer recurrence. Uh, anything that you want to comment on that stamp, uh, from that standpoint, um, Dr. Kramer? Well, I, you know, I think the uh, whole phenomenon with obesity for us has been a combination of, of, of diet and exercise intervention in combination to really uh, uh, hit it from a number of different uh, adjunctive be behaviors. And I think it's, it's really tough. I mean, I think the other thing, too, is that when you we, we talk about these things, but there's a lot of psychological aspects that go into this as well. So our psychology department and psychologists in general also have to work with depression. 
They have to work with mood changes. They have to work with life events and behaviors that really are, are also affecting some of the overall biology of, uh, of, of individuals in general, but also with patients with cancers that can be more dramatic. So there's a, there's a great deal of, uh, I think we haven't talked about enough and being a physiologist, uh, biochemist type, it's more, it, it's out of my uh, wheelhouse, but I do know that working with all our, our psychologists, that there's a lot of other things that, that relate to the whole phenomenon of, of effective, uh, effective care. So uh, we, we focus on the exercise prescriptions and individualization of diets and and obviously, in Dr. Volick's group, we work with regard to the amount of toleration of uh, carbohydrates, which is very different in all people. And also then all the psychological aspects that go on, especially in stage, the work that's going on right now in stage four uh, breast cancer. And also with some of the work we're doing now in, uh, uh, in float uh, therapy, where we're basically allowing people to reduce anxieties and help in, 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 uh, in evading some of these psychological aspects and anxieties that really amp up the ad, the, the adrenergic aspect. Awesome. 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 But I, I have a question and see who wants to tackle this. So the question says, uh, we keep talking about nutritional support depending on malnutrition status. So what malnutrition scores or tools do you recommend us to use? So I don't know if uh, Dr. Daly, you want to comment a little bit on that? So I, I think as I, as I went through, in terms of the malnourished patient, depends upon what, what the circumstances, of course, the cancer patient, whether he or she is undergoing uh, surgery, chemotherapy, radiation, or uh, neoadjuvant treatment prior to a major surgical operation. I think the, in my view, the patient undergoing a major surgical operation, say for upper GI cancer, esophagus, stomach, pancreas, uh, should at the time, if they are malnourished and if there appears to be a risk for a post-operative complication, have a jejunostomy tube placed at the time of their surgery and then received enteral nutrition uh, through the jejunostomy tube during their post-operative recovery. Once they're able to uh, take in orally adequate amounts of calories and protein, then the jejunostomy can, um, can cease and uh, ultimately, usually at about uh, 10 days to two weeks, the jejunostomy tube could be removed if it no longer is necessary. However, if it is necessary because of postoperative complications, it can be used. If the complication is such that the uh, jejunostomy feeding cannot be done, that it is a fistula occurs, an abscess infection, et cetera, then, uh, then the patient should be switched over to TPN. The question of whether immunonutrition should be used, you know, in my view, yes. But um, uh, the important part, in fact, is that the patient is nourished postoperatively. Um, and I, I would not argue if immunonutrition is not instituted um, prophylactically uh, after, the, after surgery. Thank you. Great, um, great, great answer. And, and, and also want to say that um, all these patients that are um, diagnosed with cancer uh, should be uh, evaluated by uh, the nutritional support team. Um, every setting is different, uh, but certainly uh, uh, talking to a team, talking to a nutritionist, talking to a physical therapy to start uh, with an exercise plan in a, and during therapy, actually, you saw clear evidence for that by uh, Dr. Kramer how it's important for them to keep the uh, physical activity going and to uh, keep an adequate uh, nutrition. I have a, 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 a very um, pro provocative question. The question goes something like that, um, ketogenic diet and cancer. So we know that ketogenic diet or diets that restrict uh, calories may be important uh, for uh, weight loss, maybe for cancer uh, prevention. Uh, what about uh, should this be a long-term strategy for our cancer patients? Uh, and again, this is a blanket statement, not endorsed by uh, societies, but again, what is your opinion in regards to long-term use of uh, dietary interventions for the cancer patients uh, pre, post, during, uh, or maybe at any of those states? Dr. Hurstings. 
Yes. Uh, actually, I was kind of looking forward to hearing the, the answer from my colleagues uh, first. But uh, <laughs> I, I mean, in my view, it's I think it's uh, showing great promise uh, at the time of therapy um, as a metabolic reprogramming intervention uh, to improve response and, and to protect normal cells. So that I'm, I'm enthusiastic there. I'm less enthusiastic about ketogenic uh, in the long term as a preventive approach just because of the out of concerns, I guess my traditional nutrition training, um, I do think there are some meta metabolic um, costs to that, uh, and and that you know that high fat sort of sort of diet of the long term, I'm I'm less enthusiastic about, and I think there are other ways to accomplish uh, without that um, through some of the uh, intermittent restricted diets, for example, are quite appealing. Uh, a lot of interest in time restricted, so I I would say yes. Uh, it's 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 a it's a good option around the therapeutic window, but uh, I would say no as a as a long term intervention um, uh, for for cancer prevention. And I, I look forward to my colleagues' answers on that. Doctor uh, uh, Kamer, what do you think? Well, Doctor, I mean, I'll reflect kind of what we're seeing in some of the long term studies now. I think the uh, I think a lot of the conventional. Uh, you know, nutrition is actually in, in controversy now. I mean, it's all about database development. I mean, the database on ketogenic diets is, is relatively new. So I, I will defer to the fact scientifically, we've got to wait for longer uh, term studies. I think they're going to be on the horizon. I think, you know, with regard to uh, stabilizing the uh, biochemical environment, I think there's a lot of factors uh, IGF has been mentioned a number of times. We spent a lot of time studying the pituitary gland right now, especially the uh, really the area of uh, growth hormone, which now we know is much more complex than a recent Frontiers publication and work that we're working on right now. We don't know really much of anything. And how that interacts with IGF and how it interacts with cancer is really in the offing. So there's a lot of things uh as colleagues in that area of study will tell you, uh, you know, over the last 60 years, just when we think we understand something, we don't know anything. And obviously, it's a, it's a uh, uh, integrated multivariate. My first course I ever had in cancer was taught by a, a, a professor from Sloan Kettering. And, you know, he, he taught me way back 40 years ago that cancer is a multivariate phenomenon. It keeps changing. And, and now with epigenetics and these type of things. But I do think the, uh, the the ability to be on a, 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 a carbohydrate uh, load that your body can tolerate and not create all the inflammation that occurs is really cute. Now, how that's going to pan out with regard to, you know, being in ketosis all the time, which, again, I think there's some uh, real positive aspects of that or being, being near uh, being low on inflammation and in a, in a low zone and producing some ketones in about the 0.5 area might be a little bit more. And I don't see that being difficult. I think you have a lot of, of uh, aspects from uh, other, from the industry alone, from, you know, all the lobbies that are going on, of capitalism, basically, of selling carbohydrates and all these type of things. So I think there's a lot more going on to try to understand it and also to try to see how it might work in these patients. But I mean, the ones we've seen so far, even in stage four, uh, has been very positive in the effects we see and very successful in actually seeing some of the uh, changes in, in tumor growth. And I think that happened a long time ago because obviously the metabolism of, of cancer cells is very different than what it is of, of normal cells and in, in, in the way the starvation of it and the reduction in inflammation are all there. So I, I think, you know, it's up in the air, but I think it, you, now it's at least being viewed as, a, as an option rather than just being uh, ruled out because of uh, a lot of the short-term uh, models and experimentation that have only short, they don't allow for fat adaptation of the enzymes and they don't allow for a lot of things. So there's a lot of experimental problems, even sitting on NIH panels, there's a lot of problems with the context of how we're looking at things and in the time frame that we're looking at them. But again, I, I agree. The data will start coming out and we'll learn and we'll grow in our understanding of how, how to better use uh, diets that are go against more of the conventional nutritional training. So I think, I think you are correct. And, and uh, this is absolutely fascinating. There was a very uh, interesting uh, uh, a panel yesterday, about, uh, um, a lecture panel yesterday about this uh, specific topic. 
And I think the, the, the message that we want to give is that uh, data is being produced, data is coming, and it may be an opportunity uh, to, to study uh, dietary interventions for patients with cancer for prevention and for uh, during treatment. Uh, the data is not out yet. The databases need to be stronger. Uh, but at the same time, like with everything we've been talking about, there is no one uh, size fits all, nor one magic bullet, nor uh, we are endorsing every single patient uh, to be put on a specific uh, diet with a specific nutrients. It's just a function of, of trying to bring the expertise and taking in consideration every condition of the patient. I find another very interesting question here. Um, uh, what about giving patients uh, TPN during uh, neoag during uh, cancer, cancer treatment? Uh, that was a big no-no, uh, something that people sometimes believe it was um, uh, not um, reasonable to do. Um, what do you think, Dr. Daly? I'm sorry, could you just repeat briefly the question? I apologize. Uh, the question is, uh, what about home parental nutrition or parental nutrition on patients undergoing chemotherapy uh, or undergoing cancer treatment? Well, what about parental nutrition? Sure. So there certainly is no contraindication to doing that. I think that uh, there there is a caveat, and the caveat would be end-of-life care uh, and hospice care uh, but a patient who is undergoing chemotherapy, that already puts them in a separate category uh, of non-hospice and non-end-of-life care because there's already been a decision to treat them, and the decision should be based on the premise that they have a chance to respond to that treatment and, and, and should have a good chance to, response to, the to respond to the treatment. So there's no contraindication whatsoever. And in fact, I think home parental nutrition can be used uh, for patients uh, recovering from surgery or a surgical complication while they're at home. For example, if they were to develop a gastrointestinal fistula, home parental nutrition can be life-saving for them. So uh, I think there, no, there are some contraindications, uh, but in general, I think it's fine. It would be uh, similar to other indications for home parental nutrition in the non-cancer patient. Thank you. Fantastic answer. I think I, I think that is a great answer, Doctor. Thank Thanks so much. Uh, we have time for a, a two um, more uh, questions. I have one that I've seen a few times in the in the uh, uh, question answer section. Uh, so recommendations: Should we give? Um, um, multivitamins to patients that have cancer and should we give multivitamins to patients that are undergoing a chemotherapy uh, radiation? So what is the role of multivitamins uh, in that population? Um, so I'll, I'll I have the biggest expert in the room, Dr. Hersting. What do you think? Mm. Well, the, the conclusion of the AIC or WCRF panel uh, was that the the evidence and, and again this this is well you you asked them specifically for patients and so that that can be certainly a different situation and I'll I'll defer to yeah. Dr. Neely and and to you um, on that from a prevention side as as you had mentioned the evidence is is at this point not very clear on supplements and, and their effects for prevention and so. Uh, so the recommendation is actually, you know, tr you know, focus on your diet, not depending on on supplementation. Now, I could certainly see some situations uh, in in a in a patient setting where supplementation might might emerge as as, as important. And I'll I'll defer to you guys uh, who who deal in that realm uh, more than I do. Uh, but for prevention, uh, there, there's just the evidence right now is unclear of the is any benefit. Um, at this point, and your work and others, I think we'll, we'll, we'll hopefully see some situations, particularly combination approaches, where even in the preventive setting, there will be some some assistance uh, from the supplement side. Uh, but the evidence is, just isn't there yet. Um, and like I say, I'll, I'll, I'll look forward to your answer on the on the clinical side. So, so what I can say is, for the general population, uh, again, you you keep hearing that as long as there is a uh, very complete diet 
uh, that includes all micronutrients and uh, uh, that is a balanced diet. Uh, you should not need um, multivitamins. Having said that, in this country and patients undergoing treatment, uh, it's not infrequent that their diets are quite far from complete. I can tell you that my practice, uh, 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 based on the dietary limitations of patients undergoing major gastrointestinal procedures of patients with major gastrointestinal cancers, is to supplement them with the standard doses uh, or the or the or, or the um, uh, re recommended doses of multivitamins. Nothing about that, uh, as there is no data for for cancer prevention. Um, uh, so what I would do is give a regular multivitamin uh, dose, and if they have any deficiencies, such as vitamin D deficiency or specific micronutrient deficiency or mineral deficiency, then supplement those. Um, I don't know if uh, Dr. Bailey has any uh, additional recommendations. No, I, I, you said it all and said it very well. Uh, perfect. And I think the last one, um, so we keep talking about exercise, and I think this is the last question, about exercise in the um, uh, patients that have cancer. What about the uh, pediatric uh, population? Uh, should we uh, have them... Um, uh, doing exercise? Is there any data that you know about it, Dr. Kramer? Well, well I think we've, we've written books on uh, exercise in, in young, younger people. I think that uh, any, any population across the lifespan is capable of, of training, and there's guidelines and applications for, uh, you know, prepubescence and this type of thing. So I think that, uh, I think that Definitely, uh, and if you look at some of the work done by a colleague of mine in, in Spain, uh, definitely uh, exercise and resistance exercise uh, in particular can be utilized as an adjunctive uh, type of care. And we know that, again, it's, uh, it, it plays the same role, except the role it plays in, in younger individuals, it's more related to uh, neural uh, stimulation because a lot of the mechanisms uh, in the <clears throat> younger kids, you know, Five, six, seven, eight years old haven't right, really developed uh, the 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 anabol anabolic uh, aspects of, of really size increases because growth is going on. But definitely, it can it can be used and enhance the whole phenomenon of of physical fitness and basically augment the uh, normal growth processes. So I think definitely uh, exercise is 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 as it is with anybody across the lifespan has to be individualized and properly prescribed and supervised, but I do think it can be used across the uh, across the lifespan. Well, thank you so very much to all of you. We are reaching at 10.30, and I think the next session is coming up. It was an amazing uh, speaker uh, roster, and you guys are just incredible. I learned so much today, and I really appreciate your time and the fact that you made us all um, a little uh, smarter today by what you guys presented. Uh, thank you so much, and really thank you for comparing your expertise, and I'm sure Dr. Doherty could be um, proud and, and happy to, to see all these disciplines coming together and presenting in, in his uh, name. I uh, Thank you very thank much. Thank you, Jose. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, and thank you all for distinguished colleagues. This was a great uh, process and a great uh, opportunity for everybody. Thank you very much.